Thanks, Greg, for that introduction, and uh, thanks everyone for being here. And uh, it's been a long day. Um, you know, Dr. Bij um, kind of nicely laid the foundation, some of the basic principles about personalized or individualized therapy in multiple myeloma. I'm going to take it one step further and see how what have you been able to do so far in terms of actually implementing these kind of approaches for treatment of multiple myeloma. You kind of already seen variations of this picture today, but again, I think our current approach uh, to treating myeloma is you know kind of one size fits all for most part we give very similar initial treatments we transplant patients who can go through a transplant we put people on maintenance treatments with one or two different drugs for a period of time and when myeloma comes back we go back at it using two or three different uh, drugs in various permutations and combinations and try and keep the disease under control for as long as it's possible now this this approach has worked i mean as you can see here uh, this is basically data from both mayo clinic and from what we call the seer database which is representative of the national numbers and when you look here you can see that the uh, with each you know five year period you are seeing the survival of patients with myeloma improving and it has continued to do so over the past two decades telling us this one size fits all approach does work um, to a large extent in terms of um, improving the survival. But we also know that this kind of improvements are not very even across all patients. So um, just walking through this, you can see again, these are the, the blue are the patients whom we say have standard risk multiple myeloma and the red here are patients with high risk multiple myeloma. And the high risk here is defined primarily based on some of those abnormal you know, cytogenetic findings we talked about that uh, imparts more aggressiveness to the disease. Now, when you look at it over the uh, years, you can see that all patients are surviving for longer periods of time. However, the gap between the standard risk and the high risk still is there, meaning that we cannot just continue to use that one size fits all approach for every patient with myeloma. We certainly have to start doing something a little bit different for those patients with high risk disease. So which then brings us to the question of you know, what exactly is precision medicine? I think Dr. Vich already uh, told you a little bit about this. And I think for most part, what we are doing today is this. Now we are starting to get a sense of how we can do this. Kind of more, it's more of a stratified medicine because it's not based on unique characteristics of an individual patient, but rather a group of patients based on a common characteristic. So as we go through the examples, we'll find out maybe it could be a specific mutation or it could be a specific translocation that puts a subgroup of patients in that particular um, subset. But what we really want to get to at some point um, is this part where we can take a multitude of uh, factors which are very unique and specific to the one patient in front of you and tailor the treatment um, for which is most effective for that person. So in order to get to that point of personalized therapy, we really need to, uh, obviously it, people have to be different and we already know that no two myelomas are the same. Uh, the disease is different. The host who has the cancer is different. Now we also need to understand what is the biology behind it? Why do two people or two different, or, uh, the myeloma behaves very differently in two different individuals? And then finally, we really need to have the tools in order to, uh, to basically treat these people in a different way that actually neutralizes the differences um, that drive this. So what does what do make what does my um, what makes myeloma different among different patients? Um, again, you heard a lot about it uh, today. Certainly, there are abnormalities within the tumor cells itself, which includes the the chromosomal changes, the mutations. There are obviously factors that are unique to the individual, how old they are, how functional they are, what kind of other illnesses they have. And there are certain things which are probably an interaction between the tumor, uh, what the tumor does to the host and how the host influences the tumor. And a major part of that is probably the immune, uh, how the immune system is in a given individual. And I think a lot of the focus this morning has been on trying to understand the immune system and how we can harness the power of immune system to uh, attack myeloma. And I think that is one of the best opportunities we have in order to personalize therapy uh, in multiple myeloma. And then there are certain things that you don't know when you start treatment, which can have significant impact on how 
the disease behaves over the coming years. And that is how deep of a response you get and how long does that response last. And we'll come to that in a second. I want, again, you know, there are a lot of uh, different um, things in here, but I just want to highlight, um, you know, there are a lot of different genetic changes that happens in myeloma. Some of them are very fundamental because we find those changes right away from the beginning. And not only do we find that in myeloma cells, we also find that in the plasma cells from patients with uh, muggers or small ring myeloma. So these are kind of the, what we call a primary changes. And as time goes by, uh, patients can, um, or the myeloma cells in patients can develop additional changes involving um, you know, large changes within the chromosome where they might lose a piece of it, or small changes within individual genes, which might make these genes either uh, non-functional. So the underlying concept of individualizing therapy uh, is, um, is here, is shown here. Now, this is where we are today. So you have patients with different risks. And if somebody is low risk, obviously the, they survive for a longer period of time with their myeloma. If they are high risk characteristics, they have, you know, they survive for a shorter period of time. What we really hope to do is that we can actually develop three different treatments for these three different patients with the hope that we actually get to this point, that because we gave them different therapies, they all survive for the same duration of time. And that is, I think, the fundamental principle of trying to uh, what we want to achieve uh, with uh, personalized therapy. Now, can we do this in myeloma? You know, clearly, you know, we are not to that point where we can individualize the therapy for every single patient, but I think we are making progress. And Dr. Vish nicely outlined a lot of the different uh, fundamental uh, differences um, amongst patients that can be utilized for uh, developing these individualized therapies. So one of the approaches we are currently, this, all four of these represent things that we are doing in the clinic today. So we use different drug combinations and maybe some of those combinations might be used in specific, you know, patients with specific abnormalities. We might use different duration of therapy based on what the underlying risk might be. We can target a particular level of response. You know, we talked a little bit about MRD or minimal residual disease negativity earlier today uh, in the morning. And maybe uh, we need to really strive to get there in certain patients, while others, maybe we, it's not that important. And maybe specific drugs can be used based on the specific abnormality a group of patients might have. So let's take a look at each of them. You know, we kind of alluded to these two transplants early on uh, today as well. But you know, there's some data to say that, OK, somebody has high-risk multiple myeloma. The two transplants might help some of those patients compared to um, you know, the patients with standard risk disease. Again, you know, these are uh, from uh, trials and retrospective studies, um, especially from the context of, you know, previous therapies we used to use. We still don't know if this paradigm holds true with all the highly effective three and four drug combinations uh, that we have today, but it represents a different approach that, might, that you might take for a patient with a specific high-risk abnormalities. Now, we all talked about maintenance, and often, you know, these are treatments that are, with or without transplant, you continue patients on maintenance for long periods of time. Now, there's data um, from Dr. Dodovkar's institution showing that, uh, again, patients with high-risk disease, if you gave them two drugs for maintenance, instead of just giving them uh, Revlimid alone, their survival is much better than what we would have anticipated you know, based on historical data amongst these patients. Um, can we, you know, the, the duration for which you're giving the treatment might make a difference to the patient. Now, this is not in any particular subgroup of patients, um, but in general, when you give therapy for longer periods of time, uh, the myeloma, the, those patients tend to have a better survival, but this impact seems to be more evident in patients with high-risk disease, again, suggesting that in those, those are the patients whom we, maybe we should consider double transplant, maybe we should consider two drug maintenance, and we should consider maintenance until the myeloma comes back, compared to maybe the standard risk patients, we could maybe give less intense and less um, therapy for less duration. Now, finally, the, you know, the results of the treatment itself um, and the, the subsequent therapy can be adapted based on this. Dr. Vij alluded to this, and he showed the nice picture with all the different trials that are ongoing that's asking the question, can we change our therapy based on uh, how deep a response you are getting with your planned treatment. And it seems like particularly in patients with high risk disease, if you are able to get them to be minimal residual, or if they get to be minimal residual disease negative, 
they appear to have much better survival compared to if they did not. Now, what we really don't know for 100% sure is that if somebody with high risk myeloma is still MRD positive, giving them extra treatment and pushing, trying to get them to be MRD negative, does it make their survival better? Our assumption is yes, but we don't have tra prospective trials proving that point. So now let's kind of switch gears and talk about specific drugs that we can use in a given setting. So this is an example of a drug uh, called Benetraclax, uh, which Dr. Vijay again talked about. It's a drug that's approved for treatment of CLL and um, some certain types of lymphoma. And what it does is it actually targets a protein called BCL2 that is in, uh, critical for cell survival. It uh, prevents the cells from going into a death process called apoptosis. Now, in myeloma, what we have learned is there are certain patients uh, who have a translocation 1114, which is about 15 to 20% of myelomas. Those patients, the tumor cell seems to be highly dependent on this BCL2 protein. And they tend to have high levels of that BCL2 protein. So those patients, if you treat them with venetoclax, it appears that we, are, uh, we can be very efficient in killing off those tumor cells. We know that we can make this drug even better by adding other drugs to the venetoclax. For example, you can add dexamethasone uh, and uh, also make it more effective. We can add bortezomib or other um, proteasome inhibitors and again, make this drug even better. And this is all again, targeting some of the fundamental biological processes within these um, myeloma cells, particularly relevant for that subgroup of patients. Now, you know, the question came up this morning about the uh, BRAF uh, mutation. So this is an example of a patient uh, who had a BRAF mutation who was treated with a drug called Vimrafenib that is used for treatment of melanoma, where this particular mutation is very common. And here you can see that the tumor must shrunk. Um, you can see the light chains in the urine went down. The M spike in the uh, blood really went down with the treatment. So again, showing that by targeting uh, the myeloma based on some of the abnormalities that you see in the tumor cell um, can, um, can, can have an impact on the disease. Now, many of you probably, again, um, you know, heard this in other talks too about some of the other high-risk markers like you know, uh, abnormalities of chromosome 17, which actually leads to loss of function of a gene called uh, TP53, often referred to as the guardian of the genome because that is the mechanism through which the, the normal cells die when it is irreversibly damaged. And we know that in myeloma patients, uh, anywhere from 10 to 25% of patients can have abnormalities involving this. And there are, again, drugs that are being explored in this context trying to see, can we actually target those cells with this abnormality and uh, kill them? Um, and because these cells are very resistant to the conventional therapies. So the question, the important question is, these are all really nice principles. How do we actually get these drugs into the clinic? And uh, Dr. Vich alluded to these different types of clinical trials. We have what we call the basket trial, where you have you know, a variety of different cancers, but they all have the same abnormality. And we put them all into one clinical trial and demonstrate that your drug can hit that particular abnormality and actually kill the myeloma cells. Now, this is again, um, the other approach is to what we call an umbrella trial, where you actually take a single disease like myeloma, but you treat them differently based on what the underlying abnormality is. And you know, individual abnormalities then will have to be taken to larger trials, the phase three trials that uh, Dr. Vijay mentioned in order to actually get them to the clinic. A more efficient way of doing this uh, is what we call a platform trial, but it's essentially the umbrella trial, but you have the flexibility of looking very early on to see if your treatment is working or not. So if it's not working, you drop that arm and then you add a new arm to it. So this is kind of an evergreen trial that lives on with multiple different treatments being added on or subtracted based on some um, initial assessments. So we are doing a trial like this, um, which is called the MyDrug trial, um, which is essentially targeted towards patients with what we call a high-risk disease. Now, what we mean by functional high-risk are those patients who, after the initial treatment, their response doesn't last very long despite being treated with highly effective therapies. So these patients who have and suffer an early relapse, those patients can be enrolled in this trial. We take the tumor cells from the bone marrow aspirate and we send them for sequencing to understand what mutations might be present in those myeloma cells. Now, if you find mutations that's present in at least 25% of the myeloma cells, 
And this is an important point because you know, even though we talk about all these mutations, one needs to remember that most of those secondary changes we talked about are usually not present in 100% of the myeloma cells. They are only present in subgroups of the cells. So sometimes going after just one abnormality may not pr uh, provide the long-term results that we would, um, we would want to see. So what we are doing here is, again, looking for the, the clone that is the biggest. And if you actually have a target that we can go after, let's say, take an example, this RAS mutations. Those mutations involving the KRAS or the NRAS gene is present in about 50% of the myeloma patients at the time of relapse. Now, if you have that in at least 25% of the myeloma cells, we treat them with a drug called cobimetinib, which actually targets some of those downstream actors in that pathway um, and give that treatment for a couple of cycles with dexamethasone. And then we add a combination of ixazomib or ninlaro with pomalidomide and dexamethasone. Now, the reason why we are doing this is we know from experience that just going after one clone is not going to solve the problem. It's just going to something else is going to grow up. So we want to take the best of both worlds in a way. We want to target the, mo the major clone uh, and also target the remaining cells and also target the remaining myeloma cells so that we can actually get rid of uh, as many of the myeloma cells as we can. Now, for example, if you have 1114 translocation, we will combine them with venetoclax and the same combination. And there are other mutations that are being targeted as well. And of course, if patients don't have any of the mutations, it doesn't mean they cannot go on a clinical trial. We are exploring a variety of different combinations of new drugs um, to see if that can be helpful in these patients with high risk disease. Now, one of the, you know, one of the uh, problems with these kind of targeted approach is that we need to know what is the abnormality, right? So we need to find the mutation and find a drug that goes after it. Now, um, Dr. Borello already talked to you a little bit about vaccination strategies, which I think is one of the best, you know, the most comprehensive way to individualize or personalize therapy because we're really taking their own tumor cells and then trying to see if we can elicit an immune response against those tumor cells, because that way we are trying to target, you know, abnormalities which we don't even know about. So I think this, the immune therapy, I think, as we heard this morning, will lend itself to a you know, high degree of uh, personalization as we understand this better. I won't spend much time about this, but again, um, you know, it, we also not just individualize the, the therapy, we also have to take into account patient characteristics, right? So, you know, age needs to be factored in. Obviously, with age comes, you know, the different ways that patients would um, uh, metabolize the drug, how they react to a drug, what kind of um, on, other ongoing illnesses are there, that might be worsened by the therapy. So taking all that into account is as important as taking into account the, uh, the differences in the tumor itself. So um, this, I, I just want to highlight the point from this saying that there are way, ways we can actually modify the treatment. A lot of different algorithms have been developed so that we can actually treat uh, even older patients or more frail patients with the same set of drugs that we use for the younger fit patients but modifying it or tweaking the treatment regimen by using different doses or different schedules. So they also can get the maximum benefit out of all the advances that's been made. So I think the key thing is um, the, our increasing understanding that myeloma is just not one disease. You know, Dr. Dadoka talked about why we call multiple myelomas because of the multiple um, you know, sports it can be affecting, but it also takes a different connotation because it's really not one myeloma, it's multiple myelomas. And I think these differences we need to somehow take into account when we decide uh, the treatments for individual patients. And I think this is, you know, I think we are just getting started. Uh, obviously, we need a lot of different tools that work differently. And as we understand the biology better and get more tools in our armamentarium, we are increasingly going to use a different therapy for each patient uh, that comes to the clinic. So with that, I'll stop and thank you for your attention.